A make it plain tradition. Frederick Douglass speaking before the Rochester Ladies Anti Slavery Society. July 5th, 1852. What to the slave is the 4th of July? Mr. President, friends, and fellow citizens, he who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not remember ever to have appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. The task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. I know that apologies of this sort are generally considered flat and unmeaning. I trust, however, that mine will not be so considered. Should I seem at ease, my appearance would much misrepresent me. The little experience I have had in addressing public meetings and country schoolhouses avails me nothing on the present occasion. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way, for it is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall and to address many who now honor me with their presence. But neither their familiar faces nor the perfect gauge I think I have of Corinthian Hall seems to free me from embarrassment. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, The distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable. And the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. You will not therefore be surprised if in what I have to say, I evince no elaborate preparation or grace my speech with any high-sounding exordium. With little experience and with less learning, I have been able to throw my thoughts hastily and perfectly together. And trusting to your patient and generous indulgence, I will proceed to lay them before you. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This to you is what the Passover was 
to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance and to the signs and to the wonders associated with that act and that day. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I'm glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. 76 years, though a good age for an old man, is but a mere speck in the life of a nation. Three score years and ten is the allotted time for individual men, but nations number their years by thousands. According to this fact, you are even now only in the beginning of your national career, still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad this is so. There is hope in the thought, and hope is much needed under the dark clouds which are lower above the horizon. The eye of the reformer is met with angry flashes, portending disastrous times. But his heart may well beat lighter at the thought that America is young and that she is still in the impressible stage of her existence. May he not hope that high lessons of wisdom, of justice, and of truth will yet give direction to her destiny? Were the nation older, the patriot's heart might be sadder and the reformer's brow heavier. Its future might be shrouded in gloom and the hope of its prophets go out in sorrow. There is consolation in the thought that America is young. Great streams are not easily turned from channels, worn deep in the course of ages. They may sometimes rise in quiet and stately majesty and, in, and inundate the land, refreshing and fertilizing the earth with their mysterious properties. They may also rise in wrath and fury and bear away on their angry waves the accumulated wealth of years of toil and hardship. They, however, gradually flow back to the same old channel and flow on as serenely as ever. But while the river may not be turned aside, it may dry up and leave nothing behind but the withered branch and the unsightly rock to howl in the abyss sweeping wind the sad tale of departed glory. As with rivers, so with nations. Fellow citizens, I shall not presume to dwell at length on the associations that cluster about this day. The simple story of it is that 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. The style and title of your sovereign people in which you now glory was not then born. You were under the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government as the home government and England as the fatherland. This home government, you know, although a considerable distance from your home, did in the exercise of its of its parental prerogatives, impose upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, and limitations as in its mature judgment it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers, who had not adopted the fashionable idea of this day, of the infallibility of government and the absolute character of its acts, presumed to differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and the justice of some of those burdens and restraints. They went so far in their excitement as to pronounce the measures of government unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive, and altogether such as ought not to be quietly submitted to. I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. Such a declaration of agreement on my part would not be worth much to anybody. It would certainly prove nothing as to what part I might have taken had I lived during the great controversy of 1776. To say now that America was right and England wrong is exceedingly easy. Everybody can say it, the dastard not less than the noble brave can flippantly discan on the tyranny of England towards the American colonies. It is fashionable to do so. But there was a time when to pronounce against England and in favor of the cause of the colonies tried men's souls. They who did so were, were accounted in their day. Plotters of mischief, agitators and rebels, dangerous men, to side with the right against the wrong, with the weak against the strong, and with the oppressed against the oppressor. 
More MIP after this message. What up, y'all? It's Torre, author of I Would Die For You, Why Prince Became an Icon. Check out Who Was Prince, an epic eight-episode podcast about Prince, where we talk to his girlfriends, his musicians, his engineers, his managers, all sorts of people who were close to him to find out who he really was. Follow Who Was Prince wherever fine podcasts are streamed. More MIP after this message. Here lies the merit and the one which of all others seems unfashionable in our day. The cause of liberty may be stabbed by the men who glory in the deeds of your fathers. But to proceed, feeling themselves harshly and unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and remonstrated. They did so in a decorous, respectful, and loyal manner. Their conduct was wholly unexceptionable. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn. Yet, they persevered. They were not the men to look back. As the sheet anchor takes a firmer hold when the ship is tossed by the storm, so did the cause of your fathers grow stronger as it breasted the chilling blast of kingly displeasure. The greatest and best of British statesmen admitted its justice and the loftiest eloquence of the British Senate came to its support. But with that blindness, which seems to be the unvarying characteristic of tyrants, since Pharaoh and his hosts were drowned in the Red Sea, the British government persisted in the exactions complained of. The madness of this course, we believe, is admitted now, even by England. But we fear the lesson is wholly lost on our present ruler. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers were wise men, and if they did not go mad, they became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of a total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It was a startling idea, much more so than we at this distance of time regarded. The timid and the prudent, as has been intimated of that day, were of course shocked and alarmed by it. Such people lived then, had lived before, and will probably ever have a place on this planet. And their course in respect to any great change, no matter how great the good to be attained or the wrong to be redressed by it, may be calculated with as much precision as can be the course of the stars. They hate all changes, but silver, gold, and copper change of this sort of change, they are always strongly in favor. These people were called Tories in the days of your fathers, and the appellation probably conveyed the same idea that is meant by a more modern, though a somewhat less euphonious term, which we often find in our papers, applied to some of our old politicians. Their opposition to the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful, but amid all their terror and affrighted vociferations against it. The alarming and revolutionary idea moved on and the country with it. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshipers of property clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of national sanction. They did so in the form of a resolution, and as we seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day whose transparency is at all equal to this, it may refresh your minds and help my story if I read it. Resolve that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded, and today 
you reap the benefits and the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you, therefore, may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history, the very rainbow in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and to hold it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed, I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. From the round top of your ship of state, dark and threatening clouds may be seen. Heavy billows, like mountains in the distance, disclose to the leeward huge forms of flinty rocks. That boat drawn, that chain broken, and all is lost. Cling to this day, cling to it, and to its principles. With a grasp of a stormed, tossed mariner to a spar at midnight. The coming into being of a nation in any circumstances is an interesting event. But besides general considerations, there were peculiar circumstances which make the advent of this republic an event of special attractiveness. The whole scene, as I look back at it, was simple, dignified, and sublime. The population of the country at the time stood at the insignificant number of three millions. The country was poor in the munitions of war, the population was weak and scattered, and the country a wilderness unsubdued. There were then no means of concert and combination such as exist now. Neither steam nor lightning had then been reduced to order and discipline. From the Potomac to the Delaware was a journey of many days. Under these and innumerable other disadvantages, your fathers declared for liberty and independence and triumphed. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men too, great enough to give fame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to raise at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable. And yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes. And for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. They love their country better than their own private interests. And though this is not the highest form of human excellence, all will concede that it is a rare virtue and that when it is exhibited, it ought to command respect. He who will intelligently lay down his life for his country is a man whom it is not in human nature to despise. Your fathers staked their lives, their fortunes and their sacred honor on the cause of their country. In their admiration of liberty, they lost sight of all other interests. They were peacemen, but they were preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. They showed forbearance, but that they knew its limits. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. You may well cherish the memory of such men. They were great in their day and generation. Their solid manhood stands out the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. How circumspect, exact, and proportionate were all their movements. How unlike the politicians of an hour, their statesmanship looked beyond the passing moment and stretched away and strength into the distant future. They seized upon eternal principles and set a glorious example in their defense. Mark them. Fully appreciating the hardship to be encountered, firmly believing in the right of their cause, honorably inviting the scrutiny of an onlooking world, reverently appealing to heaven to attest their sincerity, soundly comprehending the solemn responsibility they were about to assume, wisely measuring the terrible odds against them, your fathers, the fathers of this republic, 
did most deliberately under the inspiration of a glorious patriotism and with a sublime faith in the great principles of justice and freedom lay deep the cornerstone of the national superstructure which has risen and still rises in grandeur around you. Of this fundamental work, this day is the anniversary. Our eyes are met with demonstrations of joyous enthusiasm, banners and pennants wave exultingly upon the breeze. The din of business too is hushed. Even Mammon seems to have quitted his grasp on this day. The ear-piercing fife and the stirring drum unite their accents with the ascending peal of a thousand church bells. Prayers are made, hymns are sung, and sermons are preached in honor of this day. While the quick martial tramp of a great multitudinous nation echoed by all, the hills, valleys, and mountains of a vast continent bespeak the occasion, one of thrilling and universal interests, nation's jubilee, friends and citizens. I need not enter further into the causes which led to this anniversary. Many of you understand them better than I do. You can instruct me in regard to them. That is a branch of knowledge in which you feel perhaps a much deeper interest than your speaker. The causes which led to the separation of the colonies from the British crown have never lacked for a tongue. They have all been taught in your common schools, narrated at your firesides, unfolded from your pulpits, and thundered from your legislative halls, and are as familiar to you as household words. They form the staple of your national poetry and eloquence. I remember also that as a people, Americans are remarkably familiar with all the facts which make in their own favor. This is esteemed by some as a national trait, perhaps a national weakness. It is a fact that whatever makes for the wealth or for the reputation of Americans and can be had cheap will be found by Americans. I shall not be charged with slandering Americans if I say I think the American side of any question may be safely left in American hands. I leave, therefore, the great deeds of your fathers to other gentlemen whose claim to have been regularly descended will be less likely to be disputed than mine. My business, if I have any here today, is with the present. The accepted time with God and his cause is the ever-living now. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present. Hard within and God overhead. We have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future. To all inspiring motives, to noble deeds which can be gained from the past, we're welcome. But now is the time, the important time. Your fathers have lived, died, and have done their work and have done much of it well. You live and must die, and you must do your work. You have no right to enjoy a child's share in the labor of your fathers unless your children are to be blessed by your labors. You have no right to wear out and waste the hard-earned fame of your fathers to convey your indolence. Sidney Smith tells us that men seldom eulogize the wisdom and virtues of their fathers but to excuse some folly or wickedness of their own. This truth is not a doubtful one. There are illustrations of it near and remote, ancient and modern. It was fashionable hundreds of years ago for the children of Jacob to boast. We have Abraham to our father when they had long lost Abraham's faith and spirit. That people contented themselves under the shadow of Abraham's great name while they repudiated the deeds which made his name great. Need I remind you that a similar thing is being done all over this country today? Need I tell you that the Jews are not the only people who built the tombs of the prophets and garnished the sepulchres of the righteous? Washington could not die till he had broken the chains of his slaves. Yet his monument is built up by the price of human blood. And the traitors in the bodies and souls of men shout, We have Washington to our father. Alas, that it should be so, yet so it is. The evil that men do lives after them. The good 
is off interred with their bones. What to the slave is the 4th of July? An address by Frederick Douglass on July 5th, 1852 before the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. Please remember to listen, like, and wherever you get your podcasts, please give the show a five-star rating. And please do spread the word. Let's all continue to pray for each other during this pandemic and this police-demic. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been Made Plain. (laughs) 